Getting started with our conservation webinar today, I'm Casey Sheely, National Technology Specialist for NRCS's West National Technology Support Center in Portland, Oregon. Peter Robinson is today's webinar moderator. Peter is the Water Management Engineer in the WNTSC, also in Portland. Peter, the floor is yours to introduce today's topic and our guest presenters. Thank you, Casey. Good morning from Portland, Oregon. As Casey mentioned, my name is Peter Robinson, and I'm the Water Management Engineer at the West National Technology Support Center here in Portland. I'm going to be the moderator today for this webinar. We have three distinguished researchers in the area of variable rate irrigation. The first part of this hour will be similar to a technical session at a conference. I will each introduce each presenter, and they will speak from 10 to 12 minutes. At the end of each presentation, there will be a time for questions from the audience. At the end of the three presentations, we will have a 15-minute panel discussion. I will be relying on our audience to provide, today to provide us with questions, and you can type in your questions in the Q&A pod within Adobe Connect. And I will be selecting questions and then reading them to our presenters. Our presenters today are Dr. George Validis from the University of Georgia, Susan O'Shaughn Dr. Susan O'Shaughnessy from the Agriculture Research Service in Bushland, Texas, and Dr. Ken Stone from the ARS in Florence, Georgia. And I have put links to each of their web pages in the link pod that you can see from within Adobe Connect. Our first presenter today is Dr. George Validis from the University of Georgia. Dr. Validis has been with the University of Georgia since 1989. He is currently a professor in the Crop and Soils Science Department at the Tipton campus of the University of Georgia. George, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Peter, uh, for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this workshop. Uh, I'm very encouraged to see that we have a large number of participants, up to 45 now, who are participating in, uh, and trying to learn about BRI. So my presentation today will actually be divided into two short components. Um, as you can see from my title slide, I intend to tell you about how we're implementing dynamic variable rate irrigation on the farm. But I'm going to take the first uh, few minutes to explain to you sort of the basics of variable rate irrigation. Um, Peter has shared my website with you, and I'm putting this up here in case somebody wants to jot down um, some additional information. Um, this is what my personal website looks like. It has some information about variable rate irrigation, as you can see on the top left bottom left, so please feel free to visit this. So just to begin about uh, variable rate irrigation, I'll use the acronym VRI just to, to save a little bit of time. Why should we be interested in variable rate irrigation? As you can see from the four images on this slide, there's a lot of variability in our fields. Um, so that drives um, our interest in variable rate irrigation. If we see all this variability in soil type, in elevation, in hydrography, why should we, applying, should we be applying water uniformly? So I have here a list of bullet points that, uh, from our experience, are important in understanding why VRI should be used. Um, we've done precision ag research for a number of years at the University of Georgia, and we have realized that, at least in the southeast, water is the main input that limits um, high crop yield. So if we don't get the water right, all the other variable rate actions that we may take, for example, applying variable rate seed, lime, fertilizer, really are not effective unless we get the water right because water is the limiting factor. And in many parts of the country, as you well know, we are having issues with water availability. So conservation and water use efficiency are becoming critical issues. And in some parts of our country, um, the states are now limiting how much water um, producers can use to irrigate. Uh, typically, this is happening in, around the Ogallala Aquifer, perhaps in California as well now. But, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a critical thing, and VRI offers solutions to these problems. And finally, but not the least, it's, it's expensive to irrigate. In Georgia, we estimate it costs between 6 and $10 uh, dollars an acre inch of water. So, um, you know, it's a significant cost. And if you can save one irrigation on a 300-acre pivot, that adds up to real money before too long. So uh, once we have all that information about the variability in a field and we can measure this variability using different tools, um, we go ahead and, and create irrigation management zones. These irrigation management zones, in theory, are areas within the field where the soil properties, the elevation, everything that affects how the plant takes up water are relatively uniform. Um, so these are um, approximations of uniformity because we all know that if we walk 10 
seed from one spot in the field to another, we're going to encounter slightly different characteristics. So this is a, 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 the best approach we have at this point to try and create uniform areas within the field. Um, the snapshot that you see in the middle of the slide here is a tool that one of my former graduate students created so that we can enter data that we've collected in the field, like soil electrical conductivity or elevation, and it can use geostatistics to produce statistically valid uniformity areas inside the field. So what's the current status of irrigation management, management zones? Typically now when a farmer wants to create, uh, wants to install variable rate irrigation on their pivot, they contact uh, the dealer that supplies the equipment and they sit down with the dealer and they use various techniques to decide how to divide the field up into management zones. So on the left, you see sort of a cruder approach where the farmer has indicated parts of the field that uh, he or she understands require different amounts of water, and they've penciled in the approximate amount of water based on 100% being what the farmer normally applies, what each of those areas require. On, on the right is the digital form of the map. So in this digital form, every grid point, every grid cell on this map is an area that can receive a different application rate under the full implementation of variable rate irrigation. So you can see there are literally hundreds of grid cells on this map, and each one of those cells can receive a different application rate. In this particular version of a VRI from um, application rates ranging from 0% of normal to 200% of normal. Um, this particular slide is a small animation that won't run in Adobe Connect, but, but uh, Peter has created the link for you to be able to see it later. Um, but it shows a pivot that would go around in a, in a circle and how the sprinklers are changing the rates of water that they are applying based on the features that, that are encountered in the field. So over the pond, we would expect to turn the sprinklers off. Over the boggy area, the same. Over the sandy area, we may want to put on a lower rate today and come back and add another add water again more frequently. So basically, adjusting the water rates to meet the demands of that particular part of the landscape. So just to explain to you a little bit about the hardware. Um, so the way the the pivot uh, is operated physically is that we have um, a controller box. Um, excuse me. Let's start over here. We have the PC where we create our variable rate uh, prescription maps at the top, the PCs at the top of the screen. Um, the variable rate prescription maps are then downloaded to the controller, and then the controller, which is on the far left side of the screen, the controller then sends commands to individual solenoids, and the solenoids control zones of the pivot. The zones consist of a number of sprinklers that are operated together, so you could have a zone that has six or seven sprinklers that are working together, or a zone that is just one sprinkler, depending on the resolution you want in your field. Um, so you can see here the characteristic on this slide where I've circled um, a group of four sprinklers, and they correspond to one grid cell application rate. So that's the zone that, that's spatially defined by those sprinklers. And uh, this is a slide that also is a small video, short video, that shows you how a VRI pivot functions uh, out in the real world. And uh, you can link to this a little bit later and, and watch the short video. Technology exists. There are many companies that sell um, variable rate irrigation equipment. Um, unfortunately, the equipment is not foolproof. And this slide is from just a couple of uh, this picture is from a field that we're working in now from just a couple of weeks ago. And what you'll see is in the middle, you'll see this is a, a normalized difference vegetation index map of a field, which darker colors indicate more vigorous growth, lighter colors indicate less vigorous growth. And you'll see in the middle an obvious rink that's an artifact of the irrigation system. This is where one of our zones failed because the pressure in the pivot spiked and damaged some of the water valves. 
so there was a whole span of that pivot that was shut down for a couple of irrigation events, and then we noticed it from soil moisture sensors, but also by looking at these aerial images of the field. So the technology is not 100% foolproof, and that's something you have to keep in mind when you're recommending to end users on how they should maintain and monitor this, this uh, technology in the field. So I want to switch, switch gears a little bit and tell you about how we're implementing dynamic VRI. So the, the prescription maps I've talked about before are static. So the farmer and the dealer put them together, they, they decide the prescription rates, and then they use those same rates um, through the whole growing season, sometimes for year after year after year. So my concept, and, and those you'll hear from the speakers after me, is that we find a way that we can get feedback from either sensors in the field or other types of approaches that will direct us on how much water to apply in real time in these different zones of the field. And, and this is what, what I'm showing you here is a mock-up of a dashboard that we're creating for farmers to have on their phones. And so they wake up in the morning, um, the, the little circles in the field indicate soil moisture sensors. They're getting data from the soil moisture sensors which are being converted into irrigation recommendations which you see in the middle on the left side of, of the dashboard. Um, so the farmer sees the recommendations in the morning, the farmer approves them, the farmer presses the download button, and then this information flows directly to the pivot controller where the pivot, when it's activated, applies these different rates. So here I'm going to go through a couple of slides very quickly to show you how we're implementing this. The three pieces that we need are to have VRI, which I told you we have, to be able to develop irrigation management zones, which we can to some extent, and we need high-density, low-cost sensing systems. My approach has been to develop, um, well, let me see. this is the, the, the device, or excuse me, the software that we use to create the management zones I described earlier. Um, my approach has been to, to use high-density soil moisture sensing systems so that we can have really good information about what's going on in each uh, management zone. And we've developed a, a, our own soil moisture sensing system based on watermark soil moisture sensors that have been on the market for a number of years. And we've deployed these in large numbers. The idea is that we, we populate a field uh, with all these soil moisture sensors. The data goes back to a web server. At the web server, the data are crunched, um, and they may are made available to the farmer who's using them. But also, they provide irrigation recommendations so that the farmer can, uh, can act on those. Um, so we're doing an experiment where we're comparing dynamic variable rate irrigation, so real-time scheduling, with other tools that the farmers use. And I want to show you very quickly the results of this study. Um, when we did this in, in 2015 and we did it again in 2016 and 2017, basically dynamic VRI is producing about the same yields as what the farmer is uh, producing using uh, his scheduling technique. And in this case, the farmer is using a pretty sophisticated peanut crop growth model to do irrigation scheduling. The difference is that the dynamic VRI is resulting in a significantly higher water use efficiency. And the way I would like to summarize that is essentially that we're getting more crop per drop of irrigation water. Now, there's a lot of variability in the field, and some of it is as the result of the topographic features of the field, the soils, and the performance of the system. So if you look at the yellow numbers at the top of the strips, you'll see that the variability in yield is quite high as we go across the field. So in some parts of the field, the farmer outperformed us. In other parts of the field, we outperformed the farmer in terms of yields. But overall, our water use efficiency was higher. So our next step has been now to try and uh, implement using Irrigator Pro to tell us when to schedule irrigation because it's a crop growth model and it understands the physiology of the plants, and for us to use our techniques to determine how much water to apply. And so this dashboard that I show you here is not quite reality, but it's getting very close to being reality, and we hope to, it could be commercially available in three to five years, something like that. And that was my last technical slide. Um, here's my contact information again. And um, Peter, I'm turning it over to you again. Thank you very much, George. I want to remind everyone in the audience, if you have any questions for George or any of the next presenters, we have a question and answer pod that you can type in. I'm not seeing any questions right now, so I had a couple uh, that I would like to ask of, of George. 
George, now the, the sensors that you have are based on watermarks. Uh, are you comfortable that you get uh, enough accuracy with the watermark sensors to be able to come up with an accurate prescription map? So that's a great question, Peter. So the watermark sensors uh, have advantages and disadvantages. Their main advantage is that they're very cheap, and so we can create a probe with three watermark sensors, just the probe part itself without the electronics, for under $100. They are less responsive in terms of how quickly they respond to soil moisture changes than other types of sensors. Um, but the fact that, that they respond in a reasonable amount of time for us to make irrigation decisions, I think, is fine. Um, so you're not getting instantaneous response. But for irrigation scheduling purposes on agronomic crops, I think they're well suited for the purpose. All right, thank you. And uh, a second question, you have, uh, you presented some data on the water use efficiency of that one farm. Um, is that scalable? Uh, do you think that was a unique situation where that farmer was, um, was probably going to see some benefits? And if you did it on 10 farms, would you, could, do you have, um, uh, would you be able to predict with some confidence that you'd be able to see similar increases in water use efficiency? So we have repeated the experiment with the same farmer for three years in a row. The second year we had about the same results, except with much higher yields. It was just a better production year, uh, with about the same kind of irrigation efficiency gains. Uh, this year we, we are expanding the study uh, to other crops and other farmers. So we'll, we'll have the yield results here before too long to tell you the, what the answer is going to be. Um, I know that with one of the farmers that we're working with, um, he typically under-irrigates. So his crop is, is stressed for water most of the time. So our approach has been to add more water to keep the crop in an optimal range. So it's going to be very interesting to see how our yields compare to his yields and how his water use efficiency compares to ours. Um, this will be the proof of the pudding, I think, to see if, if we, we can outperform the farmer in terms of yield and water use efficiency in the case where someone is under irrigating, in our opinion. All right, and I did have one more question um, before I turn this over to Dr. O'Shaughnessy, and this comes from uh, Lee Nelson. How do you apply 200% in certain parts of the field? Do you slow down the pivots? Do you open more sprinklers, or is there a third or, or other option? Yes, that's, that's – um, so the, the, the questioner is exactly right. We do have to slow down the pivot. So some of the, the, the pivot VRI manufacturers have the option of speed control built into the – the, the, the VRI control. So, so you have to reduce the speed of the pivot compared to the normal application rate, and then your controller adjusts um, the sprinklers in the other parts of the spans that are receiving the 200% rate so that you can achieve what you want there while you're getting the 200% rate um, in, the, in the desired spot. Okay, so speed is part of that equation, correct? Terrific. Well, thanks very much, uh, George. And please stay with us for the panel discussion. I'm now going to introduce Dr. Susan O'Shaughnessy, and I will get to the other questions during our panel discussion, so please, uh, even if you, your question was not answered, don't be discouraged. If you have more, just type them in, and I'll be, uh, I'll be stockpiling those questions for uh, the appropriate moment. Our second presenter today is Dr. Susan O'Shaughnessy from the Agricultural Research Service. Dr. O'Shaughnessy has been with the ARS since 2006. She is currently a research agricultural engineer at ARS's Soil and Water Management Research Unit in Bushland, Texas. Susan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction, and good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, at Bushland, we've been working with VRI systems since 2010. We have two center pivots that are outfitted with uh, VRI hardware. And although we, we work with both zone control and speed control, I'm going to focus my presentation on, on speed control variable rate irrigation, uh, just so I don't overlap too much with the other speakers. So the goal of VRI speed control, similar to that of zone control, is to address within field variability, but to do so by controlling the travel speed of the sprinkler system. And the change in speed is commonly practiced over areas that either slope or pond or wherever the soil texture is, is predominantly different than the other parts of the field. Uh, dynamic prescription maps, they are uh, beneficial to speed control BRI practices as well. And I'll go into that a little further. 
But the main objectives of VRI speed control are to improve irrigation scheduling at the management zone level, um, and in doing so, to maintain an optimal water balance in the soil profile. And so on one extreme, to avoid over-logging or over-irrigating, which can cause water logging, um, to prevent the loss of nutrients, to deep percolation, uh, reduce susceptibility uh, of the crop to disease, and reduce um, the susceptibility to degradation of uh, crop uh, yield quality. So many farmers are interested in VRI, those who produce potatoes, peanuts, and, and leafy vegetables for that very reason. And then on the other extreme, VRI can help avoid water stress, and George talked about this, prevent significant yield losses, um, and help the farmer not under-irrigate. Uh, decreasing water loss can also mean that you decrease water uh, wastage. Uh, minimize runoff is important for environmental, to reduce environmental degradation. And then also, uh, to some degree, uh, practice um, water conservation in minimizing evaporation. And so for the farmer, improving uh, economic uh, crop yield per unit of water or crop water productivity is a benefit of, of using a VRI system, whether, again, it's speed control or, or zone control. And so just to give a, a little bit of a comparison of speed control versus zone control, certainly with speed control, the upfront costs are less. And this is an important for farmer adoption. Uh, maintenance is less with speed control, less moving parts, less parts to worry about in terms of functioning. Uh, could, with speed control, it could be used to manage multiple crops that are planted in the field crops that are planted in, in sectors. Uh, here in, the, in Texas and in the, in the western part, we're seeing farmers wanting to diversify their risk and planting, for example, half their field with corn and the, the other half with sorghum. So they're concentrating their water on the corn and then spreading it on the sorghum in case of a flash drought situation. Um, and, in many cases, the potential advantages of, of the VRI, uh, they can be realized with a minimal learning curve if the farmer starts out with uh, VRI speed control. Some of the disadvantages, though, of uh, speed control is that there's less flexibility than in using zone-controlled VRI. And in this graphic here, I kind of show that if you divide up uh, the field in terms of sectors, and if you're not able to address the variability within a pie shape, uh, then zone control would be more practical. And another disadvantage is that you may not be able to address, a farmer may not be able to address a static variability within a field in an effective manner. And so if there are, are streams or waterways that are running through a field, then they probably need to look at a zone control system. So some of the components that are, are critical to uh, VRI uh, speed control are that uh, the system should have a GPS receiver at the end tower. Uh, the resolver really does not have enough resolution. Uh, programmable control panel is necessary, and George spoke about this. And most center pivot systems do have a uh, control panel as well as uh, linear move systems. Uh, I believe that the system should have remote desktop or mobile, um, a mobile application for remote communication, for monitoring the system, and for controlling that. And many farmers are, are used to using technology in that manner. Uh, sensor feedback. I think is beneficial, and it's really um, something, as George spoke, something that's being integrated into VRI systems. So it's also being integrated into speed control systems as well. And I'm speaking of uh, sensors that address both um, plant 
assessment and soil water assessment. And then the last component that I want to uh, stress is a software package. And so that should uh, be a component of all VRI systems. And the software package is to integrate the sensors uh, and the hardware management and to make it easy for uh, the farmer to use the system. So it's kind of like the operating system of a VRI. And it um, allows the farmer to not be afraid of the system, but to be able to look at the data that's presented. So these are some of the challenges that come up with variable rate irrigation. But I'm also asking the questions in a format that, that helps develop a, a protocol or a package uh, for a farmer to think about um, when looking at a VRI system for crop production. So first of all, I would think establishing management zones is important. And what properties um, are these management zones based on? And George talked about that, soil texture uh, being one slope. Historical yield maps can be used. Any information that the farmer can provide is helpful. Uh, parent electrical conductivity maps, they give a good starting point uh, to distinguish where management zones may be. And then again, soil, NRCS soil maps are something that we're using, and then topographical maps may be of help. Uh, watering rates can be determined by soil types, at least initially to start with knowing the field capacity and permanent wilting point and how much to water to bring up uh, the soil water depletion to that field capacity level. And then what are the limitations? Uh, how many sensors are needed and where should they be located? But then again, what is the cost of those uh, sensor systems? So ease of use uh, should be premier in a VRI package. Uh, first for the setup, indicating where the sensors are in relation to the management zones. Helping the farmer to operate the system. And then helping the farmer to be aware to maintain either the system itself, knowing that the pressure is fine in different zones, or knowing uh, that the system is operating. A GIS framework is also quite important. Decision support packages, something to look for in terms of those. Soil types and textures, crop vari variables are important. And then weather forecasting. That's something that's quite new, and I think that's important. Uh, giving the farmer a, a three-day forecast uh, can enable the farmer to perhaps uh, save from irrigating if there's a potential for rain within the next three days. So again, just points to look at in the decision support software packages. Now moving into what we do here at Bushland, uh, we're combining plant and soil water sensing uh, to provide dynamic prescription maps and allow the builder to look at the maps and then interact or change the watering rate on a management zone. We base our system on uh, plant canopy temperature sensors, which we place on the pivot pipeline. And we're using an integrated crop water stress index to indicate the stress level of the crops. And this slide here, you can see that the different levels of red indicate the different levels of stress of the crop. Recently, we've combined soil water sensing with plant sensing. And with the soil water sensors, we're closing the loop so that the farmer doesn't over irrigate or under irrigate. And so we're using the management allowable depletion. And this gives you an idea of, de of the decision support, a graphic that we would give to a builder. And so it's a prescription map, but it also has the different watering rates. 
And you can see in the lower uh, portion of the field, we're using the speed control to control the speed on those eight plots. The different colors represent the different watering rates. And in this slide here, I'm just showing the corn yields um, from last year. The first eight plots were managed either by a soil water sensing and a plant feedback or just by plant feedback. And there was no significant difference in yields, but there's a little bit of difference in water use. And in comparing to what farmers in the surrounding area did, well, their yields were somewhat lower, and we don't really have reports on how much water they used to irrigate. And with this last slide here, what I wanted to show you is that another benefit of the GIS system, it provides a farmer with a map as to uh, the yield outcomes, and maybe they can analyze this map post-harvest and in, see what is going on in the field in terms of maybe there's some slopes, some outcroppings that are not amenable to the way that they've been irrigating in the past. And here you can see that the higher yields are more towards the east side of the field. And it's actually due to some slope in our field. And with that, Peter, um, I just have a summary slide. And again, I'm all the points that are included in here, uh, George went over as well. Improving yield quality, yield quantity uh, with the VRI system, reducing the potential for over-irrigating and under-irrigating are important uh, benefits of VRI systems. Great. Thank you very much, Susan. I did have a few questions, and please, uh, if you do have questions for Susan or just general questions for our upcoming panel discussion, please type them in. Uh, from my standpoint, I'm just curious, uh, how many currently sold center pivots are capable of speed control VRI? And then a follow-up question would be, um, to your knowledge, I mean, just roughly, um, uh, how many uh, people are actually using that, um, that, serve or that uh, ability that they have? I wouldn't have exact numbers, but I'd say uh, center pivots that were sold within the last 15 years at least have that type of uh, control panel uh, that can be used uh, for variable rate uh, speed control. And um, so it's just interfacing with that panel. Uh, we're using a computer to interface uh, with the panel. and other irrigation uh, companies are using their own system, single board computers and uh, remote communication. They either interface with the panel or they can interface with other uh, parts of the, of the pivot to control its movement. So I, I'd say um, a good number of, of center pivot systems. And that would be with no change in, in hardware, just a, a management change. Just a, a management change in terms of um, software that can uh, communicate uh, with the hardware systems. And <clears throat> I think that, again, would address the, the majority of those. And as far as farmers using speed control, uh, you know, again, it's, it's hard to get the, the numbers. Um, I know a lot of farmers in, in southwestern Kansas are using uh, the speed control. Uh, they're using uh, soil water sensors in at least a couple of their management zones. And um, most of the numbers that I get are from, uh, or the contact with the farmers, are when I go to these uh, field days and, and actually uh, speak with the farmers. So. All right. And, and one final question for Susan, and if you do have questions where I'm just going to stockpile them for their panel discussion, uh, this question comes from Keith Sides. Is anyone using soil fertility as a basis for the amount of irrigation applied? And, can, and a follow-up question, could this be carried over into chemigation? Um, to my knowledge, no one, at least in our area, is using soil fertility uh, to guide 
irrigation management. Um, could this be used for chemigation? I, yes, it could be. VRI systems, yes. All right. That's just a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. All right, well, thanks very much, Susan. And if you can uh, please stay on the line for our panel discussion. Our third and final presenter today is Dr. Ken Stone from the Agriculture Research Service. Dr. Stone has been with the ARS since 1989. He is currently a research agricultural engineer at the ARS's Coastal Plain Soil, Water, and Plant Conservation Research Unit in Florence, South Carolina. Ken, the floor is yours. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I'd like to talk today about uh, some research we're doing with uh, remote sensing for managing how to managing these variable rate irrigation systems. And you know, just to repeat some of what uh, George and uh, Susan talked about is uh, how do you develop these uh, variable rate prescriptions? Again, they're static prescriptions based on yield maps, farmer's knowledge of the field, uh, historically, uh, EC maps, you know, your NRCS maps. Uh, and then we have dynamic uh, variable rate prescriptions. Uh, like George was talking, he, he's doing it by putting out a lot of uh, soil water sensors. Uh, we've done that in the past. Uh, we weren't automated. We had uh, student laborers doing it, but uh, we, we tried that. And then Susan was talking about some canopy temperature uh, measurements, looking at crop water stress index. Uh, but we've, we've decided we wanted to look at the uh, vegetation that's growing in the field and using this uh, NDVI approach which is the normalized difference vegetative index. And what we found in the past with uh, some of my previous colleagues here uh, that started variable rate research in the mid-1990s was within a management zone, a soil-based management zone, we had about as much yield variability within that management zone as we had it across soil types. So we thought, well, let's Let's look at a different approach and see if we can uh, use the plants to tell us where and when to put the water on. So, so just a little background, the uh, NDVI or normalized different vegetative index is just a ratio of different wavelengths. Uh, you see the spectrum up top, but then down at the bottom you see that uh, you're measuring the wavelengths at approximately six, 670 uh, nanometers, which is, uh, which is here at the very low point, and then you're comparing it up at the high point at roughly 780 uh, nanometers. So you're getting a ratio of the reflected light from the plant, and that is what we're using for our NDVI measurements. Now that's all good good to give you a status of how the crop is responding in the field, but how does that relate to irrigation? So what we've done, well, let's look at how we get NDVI measurements. As you can see, NASA has been getting NDVI measurements from satellites for years. Uh, more recently, we can get it from aircraft, which is directly below the satellite here. And even more recently, in the last few years, there's been all these UAVs and uh, you know, small air, airplanes that you can use for doing it. Uh, you can also do it on with handheld instruments and ones connected to some of the harvesting or spraying equipment as we've been using. So what you have to do is take the uh, these NDVI measurements and convert them you know, for irrigation management into a crop coefficient. And essentially the crop coefficient is the amount of water that the crop is going to use relative to some, some reference crop or your potential ET and all. And we scanned the literature and we found several uh, citations uh, where they've done this. It's one project was looking at um, in Arizona was looking in a fairly arid environment. They were looking at cotton. Uh, another was in uh, Spain where they were looking at irrigating corn. And both of them came up with essentially the identical equation that I've shown here 
essentially 1.5 times NDVI and a, a small uh, uh, intercept value there on, for that equation. And most of you are familiar with the uh, FAO 56 uh, manual and its uh, method for scheduling irrigation. Essentially, it's a crop uh, coefficient curve where you have your initial at the beginning of the season, you have a small amount of uh, uh, coefficients or small amount of water required. And then during the crop development, that rapidly increases to a peak number. And that usually is around uh, 1.2 uh, maximum uh, crop coefficient. And then as the crop matures, it kind of stays in that range and then it goes down. So what we're doing here at the uh, at the middle of the plot, we have the equation where we're getting the potential ET, which is ET0, multiplying it by our crop coefficient that we're calculated from our NDVI and coming up with the estimated crop ET for the, for the crop uh, to apply to different areas of the field. Let's see. So we, we've had two experiments I'll talk to you about. The first was just, let's measure the NDVI from a crop and see, see how it uh, responds. Does it give us, you know, in our human environment, uh, some of the, the others were experiments were more in um, arid environments or semi-arid. Let's see how this works in a human environment. So we conducted a corn experiment where we measured NDVI throughout the season with a, a, a crop circle NDVI sensor that we mounted to a spray boom and drove across the field. You can also mount these on a pivot, uh, but uh, most pivots take you know half a day or longer to go around. And with our sprayer, we could do our plots in under an hour and, and get the data uh, relatively fast. So give you a little. little example of some of the uh, measurements that we've taken. In the upper left, you can see this is about around May 14th, which is around 30 to 40 days after planting. Uh, the brown is low NDVI, and the uh, green is uh, high. So you have very, very uh, little vegetative vegetation out there. Uh, step to the middle plot, you have it in uh, uh, essentially the end of May, about two months after, after uh, planting, you, you see there's more green showing up. But then you do have, you can see variability in it in the brown specks uh, around in that uh, figure. And then step ahead about a month and you'll see uh, much more green in the, in the uh, bottom right figure. But you can still see there is quite a bit of variability in some sections of that uh, of that plot. So give you some results from uh, three years that we looked at, just looking at average um, crop coefficients that we calculated using this NDVI-based approach. And I'm comparing that to the standard FAO 56 curve. That's the uh, black one that you see there. So if you look at the uh, red line, in 2012, we had a, a fairly normal year uh, uh, for growing corn. It was uh, you know, a normal spring uh, and all. And it followed the uh, standard FAO 56 curve you know, fairly well. So that year, you, know, you could just use the FAO 56 method for, with its standard uh, crop coefficients, and you would be doing well. But if you look in 2013 and 2014, we had a uh, cold spell in the uh, spring after planting that kind of uh, delayed maturity. So essentially that shifted the, would have shifted the uh, FAO 56 curve back about, you know, a week, week to two weeks. So if you 
irrigated base on the standard FO56, you'd be over irrigating during that early part of the year. Uh, so you could potentially save some uh, irrigation water um, during that time, during the plant growth development stage there with that. So we thought, you know, we got good results with this. Let's uh, see if we can actually implement a uh, irrigation scheduling using this NDVI-based approach. So what we did was we went to, we had another project with our corn, so we couldn't do it initially with it, so we decided to use it with cotton. So essentially, we started last year, we, and we're repeating it this year, an experiment with cotton, spatially irrigating based on NDVI measurements. And we didn't have an automated system there, so most of it was done by, uh, by students doing uh, hand measurements of NDVI in the plots. Okay, uh, essentially what I wanted to show here is uh, this is a, the red line is a cotton water use curve that was uh, developed uh, using weighing lysimeters in Mississippi. And essentially it follows the same shape as the uh, FAO 56, just, just as an example. And, and you can see on here the different stages of crop growth that we're, we're looking at give you a little information on our experimental treatments. Uh, essentially, we had three irrigation treatments. One was non-irrigated, one was based on the checkbook method, and the other one was based on uh, our NDVI measurements. And sometimes we don't get enough variability in the field, so we decided we would create our own. So we looked at uh, two different planting rates so we could have different, uh, different NDVI measurements through the field and, and, and be able to, to uh, have a little more variability. Essentially, you see that the, during the crop, crop growth stage, the uh, irrigation ranges from uh, around uh, 15 one hundredths of an inch up to a maximum of 0.3. And then during the late season, it goes down a little further. The next slide, this should be the uh, the average NDVI measurements from those two, pop, two uh, uh, treatments uh, of plant populations. Essentially, you see it starts out around, around 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.3 and 0 0.4, and you can see that the higher population has a, a greater NDVI measurement there, and you see they kind of uh, maximize or hit a plateau up around 0.8 or a little above 0.8 uh, EDVI uh, measurements. Now, we, next slide. We, we converted those into the uh, crop coefficients. And, and you can see that uh, they have the same shape as NEVI, but they're following along fairly close to the uh, FAO 56, so we're, we're fairly comfortable uh, with this system should work in cotton fairly well for managing irrigation. This is just an example irrigation event just to give you an idea of the variability in our application rates. Uh, this was on June 21st. If we went by our standard checkbook method of irrigating, we would put out a half an inch of irrigation. On our variable rate irrigation, uh, you see we had a range of uh, from the different plots under the high population of around two-tenths of an inch to six-tenths of an inch, and an average of around four-tenths of an inch, if you average, average that out. Uh, the low population uh, call for, you know, 15 one-hundredths to three-tenths of an inch, and about a quarter-inch average. So I would like to give you some uh, values on uh, water use efficiency that we got there, but uh, we, we had a hurricane at, last year after the uh, crop was defoliated and uh, our, our yields were uh, uh, compromised. So really can't uh, give you a water use efficiency on that. We're repeating it again this year and uh, hopefully we have more favorable results during harvest time. Uh, last slide, please. It, this should be a summary. Uh, we have, uh, in our experiments with cotton and corn, we 
we found and feel fairly comfortable that we can use NDVI uh, to use to calculate these spatial crop coefficients and use them in uh, managing the variable rate irrigation systems. Uh, like I said, we're going to be continuing this. Uh, the biggest biggest thing we need to uh, work with is uh, we would like to integrate this with either a system similar to George's with uh, soil feedback to make sure we're we're managing the soils and not putting too much on on some areas or or a system like uh, like uh, Susan's where we have some temperature feedback so so we're looking at, at both those approaches and uh, Hopefully, we'll have some better results with that. So with that, I'll conclude and answer any questions that may have arrived. All right, thanks very much, Ken. So once again, we have uh, our, our three um, researchers. I'm going to go by their first names, George, Susan, and Ken. If you have any questions for them, please type them in. I'm going to uh, address this uh, to Susan. Our question uh, comes from Brent Draper in Utah. Is VRI applicable to the arid west where there is no precip, no, no precipitation during the growing season? Uh, yes, I believe it is. So in, in bushland, we have a semi-arid climate. And uh, we're using the VRI system. Now, of course, we have to be careful of impacting uh, yield loss by not being able to get to different parts of, of the field. So certainly we have to take into account the size of, of the system, the sprinkler system, whether it's a center pivot or linear move. Um, that's one issue in how much water um, has to be placed down uh, to meet crop ET demands and how long that takes across the field. But in combining soil water sensors and crop canopy temperature sensors, I think you can uh, build maps so that you can address the variable crop water needs throughout the field, even in a semi-arid region. All right, thank you. Uh, I want to address this question to George. Uh, George, this question comes from Kevin Hutzel in Nebraska. To adequately uh, develop a VRI prescription map, how many soil moisture monitoring locations do you recommend in a typical full circle pivot consisting of 160 acres? Now, that's a great question that we uh, are asked all the time, and it's, it, there's no standard answer to that. Um, so essentially the way I recommend people do this is develop your irrigation management zones, uh, have some comfort that the management zones that you've developed are relatively uniform, and then install sensors so that you have some redundancy in case a sensor or a sensor node goes down. So. I would suggest that at minimum you have at least three sensor nodes in the management zone. Um, I like to average the data from those zones, from the from those nodes, to to make a decision about the sensor because, as we said earlier, there's micro variability within the zones. So, bottom line is at least three sensor nodes per zone, um, provided those zones are relatively uniform. And so, if you have only two zones in a big 160 acre field, you may be able to have only six sensor nodes. If you have a lot of variability with 10 zones, then you might need up to 30 nodes. So there's no standard answer. It's depending on the variability that you encounter in the field and how you um, want to address it. All right. Thanks very much, George. Uh, if you do have any more questions, please uh, type them in. I do have a couple here. I want to address, uh, I want to ask uh, Ken a question. Ken, did you have to make any modifications to the pump, or or uh, or how is the how is the pump handling the different flow rates over time with uh, with the system that you're working with? Okay, uh, our system we have a, a multiple pumps. We have a reservoir that we pump out of a, a well into a reservoir, and then we have multiple stage pumps and a. Uh, control system that maintains pressure in the line. Now, some system, and George is probably more familiar with this, and I'll ask him to jump in here in a minute, but a lot of people are starting to look at uh, variable frequency drives to uh, manage the, the various flow rates that you have when you turn zones on and off. Uh, and then some, some people look for uh, centrifugal pumps that have a fairly flat 
uh, pump curve so it can manage different flow rates at, at uh, different, pres different pressures and different flow rates. So, George, you want to add to that? Uh, no, I, Ken, well, I, I, I will just uh, add, compliment what you said. Um, variable, variable frequency drives are sort of the most carefree way to do it. They are expensive. They can run several thousand dollars depending on the size of the motor. And what they do is they, uh, they adjust uh, the, the RPMs of the electric motor that's running the, the pump so that the pump is, is not pumping at, um, at, you know, at, at super high pressures when, when, you, uh, when you close sprinklers down. Um, an alternative to that is to have some kind of pressure relief um, at the pumping station. So if you are pumping from a surface water body, you could bypass some of that water back into, into the pond, for example. Um, but that's uh, not as a reliable as a way of, of making sure you don't cause yourself problems. All right. Thank you, George. I'm going to ask this question of all three of our panelists. Uh, and I'm, from the NRCS standpoint, uh, we're still working through variable rare, um, rate irrigation and how we should address it. So I'll try to, um, here's my question. What are the fields and the situations where we're most likely to see the biggest benefit? Um, another way of phrasing that question is what kind of fields are the low-hanging fruit for variable rate irrigation? And I think I'll go from west to east. So. Susan, um, it, what are the fields where we would see the biggest benefits? And when I say benefits, I'm really I'm thinking in terms of the NRCS uh, resource concerns, which would be uh, uh, being efficient with irrigation water and also not leaching our fertilizers down into uh, via deep percolation into the groundwater or surface water. So, uh, what fields are the low-hanging fruit from your uh, from your standpoint in say the uh, semi-arid west? Well, certainly fields that have soil variability. Um, but, you know, I'm also going to say large size fields. Um, so here in the Texas High Plains, it's not uncommon to have uh, quarter mile center pivot systems. And the issue becomes uh, the farmers managing multiple large size fields, and they really don't have the time uh, to understand what's going on within the field. Uh, so then they have areas that are not producing uh, optimal yields. And then they also could have disease, um, like our winter wheat fields. And so I think, again, that combination of large size fields um, and soil texture uh, can benefit a farmer um, you know, this VRI system can help benefit farmers who are managing multiple and large size fields. All right, thank you. Let me ask uh, George the same question. Uh, George, you, you work in Georgia. What fields would be the low hanging fruit where you would see the biggest benefit from uh, installing a VRI system? So that's a, it's a great question to ask me because um, it's a topic that I haven't touched on today, and I think it's important for people in the southeast to, to, to also recognize this. So the biggest adoption factor for variable rate irrigation in, in Georgia has been not to really do variable rate application of water on the farmed areas, but to turn the sprinklers off in the non-farmed areas of the field. So in, in, the, in the southern part of Georgia, especially the very southwest part of the state, um, most of the fields have 10% of, or more of the irrigated area under the pivot that's not farmed. And so you can understand there's a, you know, an immediate savings in water uh, application if you just turn the sprinklers off over these non-farmed areas. And these could be wet areas, they could be drainage ditches, um, it, it could be any number of things uh, that cause it to be non-farmed. So that's sort of the slam dunk of why people are adopting VRI. Um, but uh, with, with the rest of the stuff for the farmed areas, it's exactly as Susan described. You know, it's a function of your variability, and if, particularly if you have slopes and you have obvious drainage patterns, you'll know that the lowest part of the landscape is going to retain water more, so you may be able to cut back and re-optimize how you apply your, your water. So uh, double-sided double answer there, Peter. Great. And uh, finally, Ken, and I think uh, we're past the top of the hour, so this will be our last question. 
Um, please, everyone, stay on. I have a couple uh, more um, things to add um, after Ken asks our question about what fields um, you work in South Carolina and in your travels uh, on the east. What are the low-hanging fruit for for a successful VRI application? Yeah, I, I can't add a lot uh, to what George and Susan's already said. Uh, particularly, you know, like George said, the ones where you turn it off when you go over a low area. Uh, a wetland or a, a ditch or something like that. Uh, that's that's what a lot of uh, people have put in. Uh, a lot of people are using these somewhat in some animal waste treatment sites where there's certain areas of, a, of the application field they don't want to put uh, the effluent on. So that, that's one site, particularly in North Carolina, uh, that can benefit from this uh, type system. But besides that, I really, really can't uh, add more to uh, what George and uh, Susan have already said. All right, terrific. Thanks, Ken. Uh, so before we close our, uh, our technical session and panel discussion, I just want to remind all our NRCS people that um, there is on USDA Connect a irrigation community. If you're not already a member, I invite you to, to sign up. Just go to USDA, USDA Connect and uh, do a search on irrigation. It's one of the communities there. We do have a forum for variable rate irrigation. So if any questions uh, pop into your mind in the next day or week or month, um, put them there, and we'll, we'll try to get uh, our NRCS community to, uh, to um, give their best opinions. And if we need to, we can um, refer some of those questions back to some of our researchers that we've invited here or other researchers. So USDA Connect, that's the irrigation community. I think you can be able to find it. And it's, there's a link to it in the Adobe Connect pod right now. I believe it's the last link. So you could go right there, right there now and bookmark it. So finally, I want to thank our three presenters. Um, just as a personal aside, I had a, a longer list of presenters, and I called these three people, and they all said yes immediately. So I really appreciate their willingness to do it and their cooperation throughout this uh, planning and delivery stage. It was all—it was a pleasure to work with uh, Dr. Ken Stone, Dr. Susan O'Shaughnessy, and Dr. George Velitas. Uh, thanks very much, and I uh, hope we can uh, work together again sometime soon. So I'm now going to turn it over to Casey Sheely. Thank you, Peter, and thanks to our presenters for your time and effort to make the presentation today. And thanks to all participants for joining in. We had over 50 people joining us. This concludes our webinar presentation.